Okay, uh, good afternoon. I think we'll, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, fine. All right, so I, I see a lot of, I think, new faces. I hope you'll keep coming back. Uh, at any rate, because there are new faces, I have to spend two minutes and explain to you what this is. Is there anyone in the audience who doesn't know what it is? We'll try that. Huh? Okay, Laura, what is it? Brooklyn Bridge. Right, that's the Brooklyn Bridge. So why would we be showing a picture of the Brooklyn Bridge in a session on demystifying medicine? And it's simple, because the whole purpose of this course, and in fact, of research in general, is to bridge the gap between Brooklyn and Manhattan, but as represented by, call it basic science, whatever you will, and call it human health on the other side. And the big problem is one of communication. We don't speak the same languages. So this is a course in linguistics. And even though you may be a molecular biologist or structural biologist or something else, the other person's language has a lot to tell you. And hopefully it will stimulate some ideas based on your experience and knowledge that you may bring up in the discussion, or maybe even influence the direction of your research. So today we're really uh, extremely fortunate because we have two truly you know, outstanding NIH scientists who are very much at the forefront of this uh, uh, issue of cannabinoids or in the popular lingo, uh, marijuana. Uh, the bridge is a little bit different from some of the issues that we've considered before, because in this case, we've got this tremendous uh, political, social, economic interest uh, that emerges in the public. So there's enormous public interest in this from various perspectives, which we're not going to dwell on today. What we are going to dwell on is more the scientific basis for endocannabinoids, what they do, and how they act. And that's what our two speakers will focus on. Now, just to get some of this a little out of the way, if you get off the plane, as we did in Denver not so long ago, you see big signs saying, welcome to Denver, Colorado. And all the green dots are places that have one crazy sign after another where you can buy marijuana in whatever forms you wish, including ice cream, candy, all kinds of stuff. And this is serious business because it's legalized, of course. And whoops, what did I do? No, oh, no, help. OK. Yeah, I do this all by myself. <laughs> Had it upside down. OK. So from the sort of, I don't know, sociological, economic, political point of view, there are lots of ups and a lot of downs. And if you just read the newspaper and listen to various people talk, sometimes you get the idea that with these events listed here, that the the ups in favor of legalization and so forth uh, are having uh, the lion's share of the action. You know there's increased legal recreational use in several states. The economics are really incredible to read about. The prices in one week in Washington state plunged by 40% when there was competition. I read in the paper the other day that banks are a huge problem because they're not allowed. They're federally mandated, Federal Reserve. They can't handle money that comes from, quote, drug use. So these guys are running around with $100,000 suitcases, and they don't know quite what to do with them. So they have to have guards. And it's really uh, the Wild West all over again. Uh, Native Americans, it turns out, can legally grow, sell, and profit from marijuana on reservations. So I don't know, maybe we're going to have a new form of casino operation, which may be good, I hope, for the Native Americans, who certainly need all the help they can get. And marijuana tourism is big time. 
if you want to really get shaken, just Google marijuana tours, and it includes everything. <laughs> well, this raises important questions, of course. How safe is all this? What are the risks of marijuana? And that's one of the topics that's going to be discussed today, both from a neuroscience perspective uh, and from a metabolic effect. Now, the science is really incredible to read about. And I hope that all of you will look at the references that were posted uh, on the website, because they give the history of all this. And some of the interesting questions, you know, the first uh, discovery of an actual endogenous uh, receptor. The receptor came before the ligand did. Uh, Mashulin's discovery in 1992 uh, of the first receptor, I believe. So now there's a question, how many receptors are there for cannabinoids as structures? Well, the one we're emphasizing, at least in the first slide, comes from a plant. But why are there receptors in mammalian tissues for something that's in a plant? Well, it turns out there are endogenous uh, ligands. And the first was identified by Meshulin, and he gave it the somewhat romantic name, an ant and an andamide, which comes from the Sanskrit word ananda, which means bliss, rather poetic. Well, it's an arachidonic acid derivative, and so now there are a whole bunch of others. So what are the receptors? How do they work? Why are they there? What are the endogenous uh, uh, ligands? And if there are receptors, are there antagonists? And will the antagonists block selectively different tissues? Are they therapeutically useful for anything? And most importantly is, how does all this work? I mean, what's the underlying physiology in the nervous system, in the rest of the tissues? Uh, is it innocuous? Uh, and all these various claims that are made. I think that's my last slide, yeah. Uh, so these are the things that are going to be uh, discussed. Now, I'll briefly introduce people whom I'm sure you hopefully all know or know of. Uh, so the first speaker is going to be George Kunos, who's scientific director of the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. Uh, George is originally from Hungary, took his medical degree in Semmelweis University and a PhD in pharmacology at McGill, uh, where he was a professor, came to the NIH as the chief of the Laboratory of Physiological and Pharmacological Studies in NIAAA, and in, since 2000 has been the scientific director. Uh, George has received all kinds of medals and honors and recognition for his remarkable work on the basic biochemistry, pharmacology, physiology, and disease-related aspects uh, of cannabinoids. And our, our second speaker, uh, Nora Balkoff, is I'm sure well known to you. Uh, Nora was born and graduated from medical school. Those two things didn't come at the same time. Uh, but they could have, because her record is so stellar that anything could happen at a fast pace. She graduated from the National University of Mexico, where she received an award as the best medical student of her generation. That's really something. And then she trained in psychiatry at New York University and was one of the outstanding psychiatric residents in the United States. She then spent most of her career at uh, the Department of uh, Energy's laboratory at Brookhaven, uh, Long Island, where she was director of nuclear medicine and really did her salient work demonstrating that drug addiction was really a disease of the brain. This was largely by imaging technology and this ultimately uh, led to her coming here as director of NIDA in 2003. And since then, all curves have been up 
I suspect, I know this in my own family, when they hear we're here at the NIH, and they say, oh, do you know Nora Volkov? It's not that she's a rock star or anything like that, although she may be, but I don't know. No, it's just that her impact on the public the, at all levels has been so profound in influencing understanding and policy as well as science. And as head of NIDA, remarkable things have happened since she's been at the helm. Now, she may not like this, but I have to add this, because I always thought that my wife was one of the 100 most powerful women in the United States. But it turns out, at least according to Time magazine in 2009 and 2011, Luba, I'm sorry, you weren't, but Nora, you were. She has been recognized widely as a member of the Institute of Medicine and has received all kinds of awards, uh, one of which was amongst the top people who will shape our world from Time Magazine. At any rate, we welcome both of you and really look forward to your presentations. And we'll have questions after each session and at the end. And I encourage all of you to please. The only thing I would ask is a lot of people watch these sessions online. And if they don't hear the question, they send me emails. So if you wait a minute, we'll get a microphone to you, and you'll have an opportunity to be heard around the world. George? <clears throat> OK. Thank you, Wim, for this wonderful introduction. And it can only happen at the NIH that even though I work at the Alcohol Institute and I'm speaking at an event on marijuana, marijuana, my talk will not be dealing with either alcohol or marijuana. And the reason for that is that, of course, we do research on alcohol and addiction in our institute. But in today's topic, my, it reflects my philosophy that when we get into a project and find something interesting, one question leads to another, and you don't know where you will end up. So you will find out where we ended up. When many years ago, we, my lab and myself got interested in endocannabinoids, and to some extent it was the influence of Rafael Meshulam, as we pointed out, who discovered endocannabinoid and spent a mini sabbatical in the department where I was uh, chair of the pharmacology pharmacology department at the Medical College of Virginia in BCU, and that's where my interest started in endocannabinoids. So what are endocannabinoids? As it happens with plant-derived substances, when receptors are discovered that mediate their effects, as it happened first with opiates, uh, the logical question is, why are these receptors in mammalian, including human cells and, and the body, and the answer is, as it turned out always, that there, there are endogenous ligands. There are the body's own marijuana-like or morphine-like uh, substances. So in the case of the endocannabinoids, the <coughs> key discovery happened in the mid-1980s when specific G-protein-coupled receptors were discovered that mediated the effect of the psychoactive ingredient of marijuana, that is THC. And two such receptors were identified by molecular cloning, CB1 receptors, which are present at very high levels in the brain, as first demonstrated by Mice Her Herkenham, who is here in the audience uh, about a generation ago, but are also present at much lower, yet functionally relevant levels in many peripheral tissues, as I will illustrate it in my talk. And then CB2 receptors that express mostly, although not exclusively, in cells of the immune and hematopoietic system. Now, the discovery, oops, what happened? The disc, I got it. The discovery of recept these receptors, as I mentioned, naturally led to the question, what are the endogenous ligands? And 
Meshulam had the ingenious insight that instead of going after peptide, by analogy of the then recently discovered endogenous opioid peptides, he suspected lipid-like substances based on the fact that THC is a highly lipophilic substance. And he was able uh, to identify uh, <coughs> an arachidonic acid metabolite, arachidonyl ethanolamide, which bound to the cannabinoid receptor and produced effects similar to marijuana in many different tissues. And three years later, again, his group and independently Sugiura in Japan identified a second arachidonic acid metabolite, 2-arachidonoyl glycerol, or 2-AG. Now, there are some analogs of these compounds which also act like endocannabinoids, but these are the two most widely studied uh, endocannabinoids which have been around for about 20 years. And during this 20 years, there has been an extremely strong interest and intensive research. Uh, just last year, there were over 5,000 papers in the PubMed database that deal with endocannabinoids and cannabinoid effects. And a large number of biological functions mediated both centrally in the central nervous system, but also in increasing numbers, peripheral mechanisms that are regulated or modulated by these endocannabinoids. Now, for today's talk, I highlighted a few effects in red. And when you look at these, like marijuana or its endogenous counterparts, help us relax, eat and drink more, rest, sleep, save and conserve energy, these are the hallmark of what we call the thrifty phenotype. This phenotype had a significant survival value during human evolution during frequent period of starvation. But in the last 80 years, when we have adequate food supply and an increasingly sedentary lifestyle, it has become the main culprit of what we call the metabolic syndrome, or in other words, visceral obesity and its metabolic complications, which include insulin resistance, diabetes, fatty liver, and dyslipidemias that can lead to heart disease. Now, we could speculate or, or maybe formulate two hypotheses based on, on on what I show here. These effects, if, if all of these effects are promoted by endocannabinoids, and it happens that they are all mediated by CB1 receptors, one can speculate that a unifying pathogenic feature of the metabolic syndrome is increased activity of the endocannabinoid CB1 receptor system. And something which was more practical and, of course, of more direct interest to the pharmaceutical industry that if this is so, then blocking these receptors by CB1 receptor antagonists may have therapeutic value in visceral obesity and, and its metabolic complication. And in fact, the stimulus that led to the development of these compounds was the observation that the first uh, CB1 antagonist, which was introduced by the Sanofi company in France, Rimonaban, uh, was able to reduce food intake, and this led to the idea that it may uh, be effective in treating obesity. And this was, of course, this effect on food intake reflected the fact that the endogenous uh, compounds, similar to marijuana, which causes the munchies, the endocannabinoids act as appetite-promoting substances. They are part of the hypothalamic neural network that controls appetite as first demonstrated in our lab about 14 years ago. And when Rimonaban got to uh, clinical trials and testing, it turned out not only that it <clears throat> met the expectation and it was effective as a weight-reducing agent, but first among anti-obesity drug, it was able to improve practically all of the important complications of obesity, that is, improved insulin sensitivity, uh, dyslipidemias, and it re reduced fatty liver. Unfortunately, and not unexpectedly, I have to say, it also had very important CNS side effects. For that, you have to know that the endocannabinoid CB1 receptor system is, is part of the mesolimbic brain reward pathway, an obligatory component. So if you block that, you have a reward deficit, an anhedonia, and the manifestations of that was in a significant, small but significant number of people who took it, they developed depression, anxiety, and some even suicidal ideation. And in a very risk-aversive uh, 
drug re regulatory environment that led to the withdrawal of Rimonaban from the pharmaceutical market in 50 different countries. The US was more cautious, was never introduced here. And moreover, it halted further research in this the therapeutic, um, in the ther research in the therapeutic application of CB1 blockade. Interestingly, at about the same time, a number of laboratories, including our own, have demonstrated that CB1 receptors in various per peripheral tissues, all of which are important in metabolic regulation, mediate important effect in adipose tissue. They increase uh, li lipogenesis, decrease fat oxidation that uh, results in increased adiposity, obesity. In the liver, they increase glucose production. They induce insulin resistance. They also increase hepatic lipogenesis, that is the ectopic uh, generation and that deposition of uh, fat. They cause endoplasmic reticulum stress in the muscle. They inhibit glucose uptake, which leads to peripheral insulin resistance, and so on. Now, this led us and a few small biotech companies to the idea that maybe the CB1 antagonism, the therapeutic potential of this class of drug, could be salvaged if we develop second generation compounds that have greatly reduce ability to penetrate the blood-brain barrier. And this way, we could minimize or even eliminate the neuropsychiatric liability side effect, but retain some or even most of the therapeutic benefit. And furthermore, uh, what also led to, to this, uh, this idea that we, as well as others, found that in these metabolic disorders, uh, there is a significant increase or activation of the endocannabinoid system, which was reflected in a major upregulation, increased expression of CB1 receptors in adipose tissue, in liver, and in uh, skeletal muscle. Here you see the animals which were fed a normal diet or became obese uh, mice fed a high fat diet, have a greatly increased amount of CB1 receptors in the liver, which is normally very low. Same in adipose tissue, obese versus non-obese, and in the mouse, lean versus obese mice. And the amount of the endocannabinoids were also increased, which is not shown here. So at this time, we were approached by a small pharmaceutical company that uh, also recognized this possibility and developed uh, and modified CB1 antagonist with reduced vein penetrance and asked if we could collaborate because they knew our interest in, in this, this problem. So the compound that I will talk about uh, in the rest of my talk is this JD, I will just refer to it as a JD compound, is a structurally modified derivative of the brain penetrance CB1 antagonist ibipinaban, which was developed by the Solvay company it never got to clinical testing because by the time it was ready, Rimonaban was withdrawn, so all further research with all the other Rimonaban-like substances stopped. Now, this compound, as I mentioned, the modification resulted in a much reduced brain, pen brain penetrance, as I will illustrate in the other slides. Um, luckily, however, it didn't affect, actually didn't reduce, but strangely even increased the affinity of the compound to the CB1 receptor about a tenfold increase from about eight to or twentyfold increase in potency and retain the same selectivity to CB1, much less effective on CB2 receptors. And similar to the parent compound, it acted as an inverse agonist, which means not only that it blocks the effect of an agonist, but in the absence of agonist, it produces an effect opposite to the agonist, that is, in this case, decreasing the GTP gamma as labeled. I won't go about the other minutiae, what molecular properties explain its limited brain penetrance. I will just illustrate that. So for, to, to establish how well or how poorly it gets in the brain, the first approach was we measured the level of the compound after either acute or chronic oral administration uh, to mice. That was the model, the high fat fed mice that we used in these early studies and measure the level of the compound in plasma and brain and found that the parent compound, this is the plasma level, has significant levels in the brain, which as I mentioned, causes significant receptor occupancy. 
whereas the JD compound has greatly reduced brain penetrance and only about uh, five or six percent of the total, uh, uh, sorry, in this case about three percent of the total, and even after chronic administration where the brain penetrant compound have high levels in the brain, the amount of the JD compound compared to the plasma concentration is still very low. Both compounds accumulate significantly in the liver that may explain their very high efficacy in reducing fatty liver as I will, uh, well, today I will not get, get to that, but that, that's one of the interesting factors. Now, even though the amount in the brain is very low, and even with that low amount, most of it is non-specifically bound to uh, proteins, we still wanted to be sure that the very small amount of free drug is not whether it can or cannot occupy receptors in the brain. And the state-of-the-art approach to do that in real time is CD1 PET studies, position, positron emission tomography studies. Bob Innes here at the NIH developed, was among the first to develop a very good CB1 receptor antagonist PET ligand. And we collaborated with him in these studies. So what you see here is a mouse brain showing the uptake of the radio-labeled PET ligand in an animal that just received vehicle about an hour before the injection of the PET ligand. When another animal was injected with the brain penetrant compound SLV, and the doses here for both compounds were selected as the maximally effective dose for various metabolic parameters, then you see that there's a very significant suppression of the uptake of the radio labeled compound because the brain penetrant compound itself occupied the receptor and it prevents the radio ligand to do that. Whereas a similar maximally effective dose of the JD compound causes absolutely no displacement, indicating that at, the, at, at a dose which produces maximal metabolic benefit, it doesn't occupy a significant fraction of the uh, CB1 receptors in the brain. And the same lack of occupancy could be demonstrated in animals that were treated for four weeks daily with oral doses of the uh, compound compared to vehicle. So as expected, or uh, this lack of brain receptor occupancy also resulted in the absence of CNS side effects in these animals that can be attributed to blockade of CB1 receptors in the brain. We used two tests. One is that an, if an animal, a mouse, is injected with a highly potent CB1 agonist compound, marijuana-like compound, it develops catalepsy, which is measured in the mouse in a simple assay, a horizontal bar. One puts the mouse with its, its two, hand, uh, two uh, front paws on, on the bar, and the normal mouse doesn't like to be hung up like that, immediately releases the bar and runs away. So the amount of time that the mouse spends on the bar is indicated here. If the mice, mouse is pretreated with this potent agonist, it hangs on for over 10 seconds before he's able to release and let go. If he's pretreated with the non-brain penetrant CB1 antagonist, the agonist is still able to, use, to cause almost the same degree of catalepsy as in the control animal. However, if it's pretreated with the same dose of the brain penetrant compound, the ability of the agonist is completely blocked. It's, the effect is similar to what happens if the animal gets just vehicle. Another uh, test which is widely used in the pharmaceutical industry, it's a relatively simple test. Drug-naive mice, which are in injected with a CB1 penet brain penetrant antagonist, become very difficult to handle and run around for hours in the cage, which could be actually quantified by the interruption of infrared beams. And you see here the brain penetrant compound, a single injection in this case causes a huge increase in motor activity that is, is still significantly higher than uh, background after two hours, but whereas there is no significant effect with a similar dose of the JD compound. So in uh, about five years ago, I was talking at the same session, Demystifying Medicine, and I told you about our first uh, study with, with, an ana with an earlier analog of, of uh, a peripheral CB1 antagonist on a mouse model of diet-induced obesity. And this is uh, 
a model where uh, C57 black six mice, which have a preference for fatty food, if they are exposed to uh, food high in fat, within a few months they develop a very high degree of obesity, their body weight doubles, their liver becomes uh, fatty, they develop insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, and all of these effects are very effectively antagonized by the peripheral antagonists. However, these mice only develop insulin resistance, which means their plasma insulin levels increase very high level to maintain blood glucose at normal or slightly ele elevated levels. But they never develop full frank type 2 diabetes because their uh, pancreatic islets, which is the source of insulin, are able to compensate for the insulin resistance by proliferation and putting out increased levels of insulin throughout the life of the mouse. So we were wondering what, what happens if we test the role of peripheral CB1 receptors, if any, in a model of true type 2 diabetes. And there is such a model. It's called the Zucker diabetic fatty rat. So a little bit of background on this. The Zucker fatty rat is a obviously from its name, it's an obese rat type. Uh, there, the reason for their obesity was a, a spontaneous mutation in the leptin receptor. Leptin is the uh, peptide hormone generated in adipose tissue that suppresses food intake and reduces body weight. And if, it, if it's unable to produce its effect because the receptor has an inactivating mutation, the animal uh, becomes hyperphagic, it eats more and becomes obese. These animals, again, become insulin resistant, but don't develop diabetes. Many years ago, uh, somebody undertook a project where they selected the few animals that had elevated blood glucose level. And with selective breeding, they developed a subline of this uh, strain, the Zucker diabetic fatty rat, which actually very nicely replicate the natural history of human type 2 diabetes. As you see here in this curve, when the animals are born, they are normal glycemic, blood glucose is normal, even their insulin is normal, but by the age of six weeks, their insulin level skyrockets almost tenfold, but it's still able to compensate and keep blood glucose at normal level. Now, in the next four to five weeks, the animals start to develop very pronounced and even extreme hyperglycemia, and at the same time, it's shown in yellow, their plasma insulin drops to what appears to be normal level. But this is actually due to the fact that their beta cells the islet, in the pancreatic islet, that is the source of insulin, are actually dying off. So there is no more source of insulin at this point. Uh, there is a parallel drop in the C-peptide, which is usually a marker for insulin secretion. So that indicates that the reason for this drop is that the secretion of insulin is reduced not that its elimination is increased. Now, what these animals I didn't mention are controlled, but they were treated with vehicle. But what happens if we take another group of these animals and treat them daily with the CB1 antagonist, the JD compound, the peripheral CB1 antagonist, for about three months? As you see here, the treatment completely prevented the appearance of hyperglycemia for about four weeks. So there is a significant delay in the onset of this process. And even when hyperglycemia started to develop, its level remained significantly below the vehicle-treated animals throughout this period of treatment. And at the same time, the treatment also largely prevented this loss of uh, insulin and C-peptide due to the elimination of the beta cells. As you see here, the, both plasma insulin and C-peptide remains high. So this then suggested that uh, the CB1 antagonist treatment somehow is able to preserve the beta cells. Now, first, we want to have some functional evidence. What is the function of beta cells and how do you test that? And this, the first test in vivo is very similar to the way diabetic patients are somehow, sometimes tested for the function of their own beta cells, and that is uh, glucose-stimulated insulin release. So beta cells produce insulin, and when blood glucose rises, that's the most powerful stimulus for the increased production and release from the beta cells. 
you can test that by giving a, a single bolus of glucose. Uh, for people, you drink a, a bottle of juice. In the animals, we give it intraperitoneally, and then measure within five minutes the increase in plasma insulin and C-peptide levels, which is measurable and significant. The obese animals have a greatly elevated basal insulin release, but become almost completely unresponsive to the glucose stimulus. There is no significant further increase in insulin or C-peptide. Whereas the animals that were treated with the peripheral CB1 antagonists, even though their basal insulin and C-peptide, if anything, increase a little further, now you see that the glucose stimulus causes a significant further increase in insulin and C-peptide. And this is even more clearly and quantitatively demonstrated where, when instead of using in vivo, uh, an in vivo model, we isolated pancreatic islets, perfused them with a buffer to which we added increasing doses, or in this case, concentration, increase the concentration of glucose. And you see here, islets from normal rats have very low, small amount of insulin release. And then as you increase glucose, there is a very nice dose-dependent progressive about four to five-fold increase in insulin released from the islets that you can measure in the, in the medium. The vehicle-treated diabetic rats have very high basal release of insulin, which is not responding at all to the increase in glucose concentration as in the in vivo model. And again, as happened in vivo, Islets isolated from the JD-treated diabetic animals, their basal levels are as high or even higher, but now you see a very nice dose-dependent progressive increase. The scale is different, so it's actually quite remarkable. It's about a threefold increase from the low to the maximal level. So that means that the loss of beta uh, islet cell function is preserved by uh, treatment with the JD compound. So what happens in the islets? Can the histology uh, prove or support these findings? What we found here is that this is an islet from a lean mouse, and we used immunostain, an insulin antibody, and the color is brown, and showing that normal islets are very rich and have high insulin content. The diabetic islets is enlarged, somewhat disorganized, and the insulin content is dramatically reduced. Uh, similarly, uh, insulin mRNA is also showing this very uh, dramatic reduction. And in the treated animal, the enlarged uh, islet size remains, but there is a marked increase in both insulin content and insulin message level. At the same time, we also notice that there is a large number of apoptotic cells in the diabetic islets by tunnel staining, which are not present in the lean animal, but also absent in the JD-treated animal. At the same time, CB1 receptor expression in the islet, which is low in the lean animal, becomes significantly increased in the diabetic animal, and that's also reversed by the antagonist treatment. Now, one of the other things we noticed that the <coughs> large cell infiltration that we observed in the vehicle-treated diabetic animals turned out to be uh, pro-inflammatory macrophages. When we stained with an antibody against the macrophage marker CD68 molecule, we see a significant increase in CD68 positive macrophages, and this increase is reversed uh, to a large extent by the peripheral antagonist treatment. At the same time, the MLRP inflammasome, and I will describe what it is, is also causes a, a parallel increase, and that too is reversed uh, by the antagonist treatment. Now, inflammasomes were discovered about 15 years ago, and they are a protein scaffold that the cell produces, and their, their role in the cell is that they serve as a scaffold to an pro-inflammatory protein mach machinery. The NLRP inflammasome, there are about 12 or 13 different inflammasomes. This particular inflammasome is known to be responsive to metabolic danger signals. And the inflammatory machinery that it assembles involves uh, NF-kappa-B, uh, the protease enzyme caspase-1, which whose main role is it converts uh, 
inactive or pre IL-1 beta and IL-18, these are pro-inflammatory cytokines. They, it converts them from an inactive uh, a precursor to the active uh, uh, cytokine. Next slide just shows that these macrophages, not only that they produce the inflammasome, but as might be expected, they represent the pro-inflammatory M1 as opposed to the M2 phenotype. N1, M1 markers are increased. M2 markers are decreased in the diabetic uh, islets compared to normal, and the changes are reversed in the islets from the JDT-treated diabetic animals. And this just shows that not only the inflammasome is increased, but as one might expect, the protein machinery that is assembled on the inflammasome is also increased. NF-kappa-B goes up, caspase-1 activity, here we measure the activity enzyme, it goes up, and the amount of actual active IL-1 beta and IL-1 beta and IL-18 proteins are also increased, and all of these changes are normalized or nearly normalized by the antagonist treatment. So at this point, we consider that one of the possibilities that the targets of the CB1 antagonist treatment may be on the um, islet, uh, insulin-producing islet cells themselves. However, I will show you a number of uh, several lines of evidence to suggest that instead of this, the unexpected conclusion from our experiment was that the target of the CB1 antagonist and its beneficial effect is, is CB1 receptors on these pro-inflammatory macrophages. It, and the mechanism that the results, and I, I say it in the beginning, and you will see the evidence that supports it, that endocannabinoids acting on these CB1 receptors promote their transmigration into the tissue, in this case, into the pancreatic islets, and also promotes the uh, increased expression of the inflammasome, increased IL-1 beta and IL-18 production, and these cytotoxic cytokines are there released from the beta, uh, from the macrophages and act on the neighboring beta cells to kill uh, the cells by apoptosis and this way induce diabetes through the lack of insulin. So the first evidence is, oops, oh, the first evidence is that CB1 receptors are not really well co-localized to insulin producing beta cells. As you see here, the beta cells are visualized by an insulin antibody. The CB1 antibody shown red, it's mostly localized on the perimi perimeter of the islets, and when you overlay them, and the co-localization is very minimal. It's, it's less than 15%. On the other hand, the CB1 receptors show a nearly perfect co-localization with CD68 positive macrophages in the islet. Here it shows the overlay. And there's also co-localization of the inflammasome with the pro-inflammatory macrophages and one, as one might expect it, shown here. The second line of evidence came from a tool we used, uh, which is a compound called clodronate. Clodronate is taken up by phagocytic macrophages and causes their apoptosis. So the way we did, and, and this way it can actually lead to a depletion of macrophages. Clodronate is packaged into liposomes, and uh, diabetic, my, diabetic rats are treated with these uh, liposomes, which could contain either clodronate or just empty liposomes. If you treat the rats with empty liposome, they show the, the uh, typical gradual increase in blood glucose level during that early life period. In the clodronate-containing liposomes, the treat. pointer doesn't show. Anyway, as you see, the progressive increase in, in uh, blood glucose is nearly completely prevented throughout this treatment period. And at the same time, the clodronate treatment also uh, results in increased uh, insulin and uh, C-peptide levels, indicating of preserving uh, beta cell function. Another observation we made that this mechanism uh, probably operates in humans. In a collaborative study with Monica Scarulis in, from the Diabetes Institute, we collected um, blood-derived monocytes from 28 
normal volunteers, uh, place, uh, isolated them, placed them in culture, and induced their differentiation into macrophages. And when you expose the cells to the uh, endocannabinoid anandamide in vitro, it causes a marked increase in the cellular contain, uh, content of the inflammasome, its associated protein, and also in the level of CB1 receptors in these cells, and also causes a significant increase in immunoreactive IL-1 beta and IL-18. And all these effects could be blocked by the simultaneous presence of the CB1 antagonist JD, which is the last two columns, the antagonist alone and the antagonist plus and endomite together. However, the strongest evidence we think that we could present is the effect of selective knockdown of CB1 receptors only in these phagocytic macrophages. So the approach we took was a uh, very innovative approach that uh, my colleague Michael Check introduced several years ago in an interesting nature paper. And the approach is that if you develop small interfering RNAs against the CB1 receptors and packages these in uh, glucan, beta-D-glucan particles. Beta-D-glucan is the ligand for the dectin receptor, and the dectin receptor is uniquely expressed on the surface of phagocytic macrophages. So if you package these sRNA in these glucan particles, glucan encapsulated uh, RNA particles, uh, just abbreviated as GURPS, these GURPS are selectively taken up in macrophages where their content is released in the lysosomes, and then the sRNA can target the uh, gene against which it was developed and knock it out. So the approach is first you have to develop the uh, right uh, type of sRNA, and in this case we showed the one which we finally selected, which causes a very robust, robust dose-dependent, near-complete knockdown of the CB1 receptor with no effect on CB2 receptor, showing uh, its selectivity, and also the scrambled siRNA, which doesn't recognize the target, has no effect, showing selectivity. Then <coughs> you treat animals with GURPS containing siRNA or just a scrambled RNA, and after 10 days treatment, isolate peritoneally elicited cells. The glucan capsule was labeled with FITC to facilitate fluorescent cell sorting. And then we also immunologically label either the macrophage-specific CD68 with an appropriate antibody or CD3, which is a lymphocyte marker. And what we show here is that there is a, a great enrichment of GURPS, about 10 times more in CD68-positive macrophages than in CD3-positive lymphocytes. And when we isolated an enriched, pop an enriched population of these cells by fluorescent cell sorting and then measure the level of CB1 and CB2 mRNA, we found that in the macrophages, there are robust 70% knockdown of the CB1 receptor with no change in CB2, whereas in the lymphocytes isolated, there is no change in either receptor. So when we use then these CB1-containing GURPS and treat the animals for about for 10 days daily, we found that during the treatment, the progressive rise in blood glucose is completely prevented, and at the same time, insulin and C-peptide levels are significantly increased, indicating uh, preservation of beta cells, which is further illustrated here in, with histology. So these few slides now are unpublished results. We were encouraged by these findings, which were published uh, two years ago in Nature Medicine, and contracted a company that helped us develop a CB1 receptor knockout ZDF red model. So on the original diabetic uh, background, we, we el eliminated the CB1 receptors globally in these animals. As you see here, you, can, you have to genotype these animals because they are uh, generated by heterozygote breeding, both for the leptin receptor mutation and the animals which are illustrated here were all knockouts or all positive for this mutation. So they were ZD1, ZDF positive animals. Some of them had normal levels of CB1 receptors, the wild, and some were all 
knockouts for the CB1 receptor as well. And the functional assay confirmed that the CB1 receptor stimulated GTP gamma as binding, and the knockouts had no such effect. And what we found, I will just focus on this slide, quite dramatic. The ZDF animals, which were wide type, for, which had normal levels of CB1 receptors, as we many times observed before, gradually developed very pronounced extreme hyperglycemia. The ones which were heterozygote for CB1 receptor just had one allele, had a similar uh, time course. However, the ZDF diabetic mice, which lacked CB1 receptors, remained completely normal glycemic up to 26 weeks of age, even more dramatic effect than we got with the antagonist. And this was also paralleled by the preservation of insulin and pro-insulin level. And the next slide just shows that in the lean animals, high insulin-containing islets, in these old uh, ZDF Y-type animals, there's a nearly complete destruction or atrophy of the islet with very strongly reduced insulin content. The knockout had, doesn't have this atrophy. It has an enlarged islet, but the insulin content is uh, close to normal. And when we stain for infiltrating macrophages with the CD68, these atrophied islets show significant staining, nothing here or in the knockout animals. And the few islets which are larger are actually very highly populated with infiltrating macrophages. So this suggests that this model would be very interesting to further explore the role of CB1 receptors in uh, these animals. So in the last couple of minutes, if I may, I don't even know if I have time, maybe just five minutes. As in human diabetics, these animals also develop severe diabetic nephropathy, which means uh, kidney disease. And just a few words of diabetic nephropathy, it's primarily a disease affecting the glomeruli. It's the most common cause of end-stage renal disease in people. A major pathogenic factor is the injury of podocytes, which are specialized vascular cells that maintain the integrity of the glomerular filtration apparatus and also regulate glomerular filtration rate. And finally, that it's widely recognized that the renin angiotensin and hyperglycemia are the two main drivers of diabetic glomerulopathy. So with that, we looked at these uh, diabetic animals and found, as I already showed before, they are hyperglycemic. And indicators of the glomerulopathy, they have significant albuminuria, greatly elevated uh, plasma creatinine, blood urea nitrogen, and very dramatically reduced glomerular filtration rate. All of these were normalized by CB1 receptor treatment. However, in this case, the mechanism is different than in the islets, because in the islets, we get a similar reversal of hyperglycemia when we did macrophage depletion by clodronate. However, the macrophage depletion didn't do anything to the nephropathy. And this is further confirmed in this slide. There was no significant macrophage infiltration that you, we could find in the kidney, in the glomeruli of these animals. No change in the NLRP inflammasome, caspase 1 of IL-1 beta. However, there was another pattern of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, TNF-alpha, uh, IL-6 were increased, and the apoptotic marker caspase 37 was increased, and these effects were reversed by CB1 blockade. So the mechanism is somewhat different. Now we look at the podocytes, which are known to express CB1 receptors. In diabetic animals, there is a marked decrease in the number of functional podocytes by immunostaining, and it's preserved in, when animals are treated with the CB1 antagonist, shown here for protein an mRNA for an important proteins in the podocyte, podocin and uh, nephrine that are important to maintain podocyte integ integrity. And at the same time, CB1 receptor expression in the glomeruli is increased. And as you see here, the CB1 receptor tends to be expressed in the podocin-containing podocytes. So that suggests a cause and effect relationship between these two. Uh, yeah, I'm finishing. I just, th this slide just shows the key role of angiotensin and high glucose in these effects. And in conclusion, the increased CB1 signaling in the macrophages 
promotes their transmigration into islets and activates the inflammasome. And this is then responsible for the beta cell loss due to a paracrine, uh, paracrine mechanism mediated by cytotoxic IL-1 beta and IL-18. And peripheral CB1 blockade thus uh, delays the progression of type 2 diabetes and protects the beta cells. Nephropathy uh, can develop in the absence of hyperglycemia and macrophagia infiltration. What I didn't have time to show is that both high glucose and angiotensin II induce podocyte damage, and the effect of both was inhibited by CB1 blockade, suggesting that CB1 receptors and endocannabinoids may represent a common pathway through which both high glucose and angiotensin II cause uh, renal damage in diabetic nephropathy. And the final conclusion, that all this suggests that peripherally restricted CB1 antagonists do have therapeutic potential in type 2 diabetes and its complications. So with this, I will conclude and just give credit to the people in my lab who did the study. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Work. We have time for a couple of questions, please. I am be concise. Uh -huh. Yeah. What is the clinical status of the CB1R antagonist now? Is it still in the experimental studies or it is moving to clinical evaluation? Several years ago, I applied for a, a Bridges grant and was fortunate to get one on behalf and collaborating with this company. And these uh, IND enabling toxicology studies are in progress. So there are a lot of things you have to get through, but hopefully when it's, it's the end is to get an IND and do it in the clinic. And we already lined up collaborators who are interested in participating. George, I'm interested in the effect of endocannabinoids on osteogenesis. Mm -hmm. Is there any effect of the of the uh, JD antagonist on bone in those animals that you follow for a long period of time? The JD wasn't tested. The original studies by Itai Bob, who tragically passed away, an Israeli scientist, uh, established that CB1 receptors are present in both osteoblasts and osteoclasts and have a very a very important role and actually may even participate, may have some pathogenic role in osteoporosis. My former postdoc, Yossi Tam, who is uh, there on the second from Israel, that was his PhD thesis work, and he's back at the Hebrew University and is probably continuing both our work and the uh, bone-related work. George, is there any evidence that an increase in, in either endo or exocannabinoids can accelerate? these lesions? Well, endocannabinoids, as I was trying to show, are certainly seem to be responsible for the disease. The interesting thing is the relation with marijuana use. You might conclude that if, that based on this, that marijuana use will lead to obesity, diabetes, and so on. And this is not the case. Even our own st collaborative study with Nora and Monica Skaroulis didn't find any significant effect on glycemic control in uh, heavy marijuana users. And the most likely explanation, which was first suggested by Gerald Reven, who coined the term uh, metabolic syndrome, is that chronic heavy marijuana smoking leads to very rapid desensitization of the receptors. So it doesn't, ref and interestingly, endocannabinoids do not desensitize CB1 receptors, as recently shown in a Nature Neuroscience okay. paper. Well, thank you very much, and we'll have time for more discussion after. I'm going, well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I think uh, George and I were saying this is the third time that we've been together on this, in these uh, sessions that we're linking Brooklyn with, with Manhattan. I was trying to figure out actually if the science is Manhattan or the science is Brooklyn. But, and I, what I'm going to be doing today is actually I'm going to be uh, jumping in and doing a very different presentation from the wonderful one uh, that you heard from 
from George, but it's, uh, I mean, I think that it's a very good uh, lead way because clearly, as you see from his work, where he's actually focusing on the pancreas, now on the kidneys, and before on the liver, um, endogenous cannabinoids are extraordinarily important. And as a result of that, pharmaceuticals for many years have been uh, interested on developing uh, um, either agonist, antagonist, inverse agonist as potential therapeutic uh, targets. And it's very likely that this process of the fact that cannabinoid receptors are regulating a lot of the properties, while we're starting to have this uh, enormous interest, widespread, I almost call it like a delusion in the whole world about the potential benefits of marijuana for treating everything that we can think of. And, and, and you know, the thing that I was thinking, George, when you were presenting this study with uh, the rats also is, while it is true that you do not have greater range of obesity among people that are marijuana smokers, and there was no evidence of hepatic damage, we do know that from the studies of the groups in France that if you already have liver damage, then smoking marijuana exacerbates the steatosis. So my question as I was sitting down and listening to it is I said, I'd like to see if you are obese and you're actually smoking whether in marijuana, whether in that case, that may increase your risk for diabetes. But I think that it's the sorts of questions that we need to pose within the context, and certainly very interesting. So here I am, and I'm actually criticized, and, and uh, NIDA is interfering with the research of the world on marijuana, blah, blah, blah. And, and it's an interesting phenomenon, because it's really, over the past five years, we've seen a dramatic change in the attitudes of people vis-a-vis -vis marijuana. In five years ago, more than the majority of people in the United States would say the use of marijuana on a regular basis is, is harmful. In five years, that has changed to being the minority of individuals. And during that five-year period, it's not like there has been a massive amount of information that has shown that marijuana is not harmful. Not at all. There's really none. And I think it's, again, our, the need of our brain of polarizing things, are, they are either good or bad without recognizing that there is an intermediate state that needs to be taken into to evaluate the extent to which, under certain conditions, marijuana can be harmful, and under other conditions, it might not. And in this whole dialogue, which has been polarized now, that level of discourse has been eliminated. So what I'm going to try to do to you is present you where the evidence is and where the evidence is lacking, and focusing, obviously, on the main issue as it relates to the brain, because now I'm going to jump to the brain. Not that I don't care about the pancreas and the liver and the heart and the kidneys. I like them very much, but I like the brain more. We all know that marijuana is the most frequently uh, drug, illicit drug use in the world. And in the United States, it's estimated that 140 million people have tried it at least once. And, um, and every year, there are like 2.3 or 2.5 or 2.4 new initiates into marijuana taking. And the question is, uh, obviously, it emerges. The notion is this harmful to you or not? Now, it is, again, when you're asking the question about where it's harmful or not, I want to actually, and in most of my presentation, but not all of it, is going to be focused into the stage of adolescence and young adulthood, because that is the stage at which your brain is much more plastic. And as a result of uh, drugs, what they do is basically they trigger they activate the molecular targets of neuroplasticity by which the brain actually strengthens the connections between uh, synaptics, by which synapses actually interact with one another. When you are young, those uh, neuroplastic changes of your much faster, your brain actually is able to learn faster. But the, the negative side of that is if you get exposed to drugs, that transition into the strengthening of those synapses that link the drug with a reward are actually occurring faster, long-lasting, and therefore you can become addicted fa uh, much more rapidly and for a more severe way if you start early in, in the adolescence, young adulthood. For all of the drugs, that's not unique for marijuana, all of them. The younger you are in initiating drug use, the worse the outcomes vis-a-vis -vis addiction. Now, what is the, currently the status of marijuana among teenagers? Again, I'm emphasizing them because they are going to be the most vulnerable. And what you've seen is a result, what I'm showing you here, is a result that comes from a survey that we found at the University of Michigan that actually samples every single year close to 46,000 kids at schools throughout the whole United States. And we ask them questions about what is, have they been exposed to different drugs, did they take them, and also about their perception of risk. 
What I'm showing you here is the prevalence of a percentage of 12 graders at 17 to 18 years of age reporting past month use of cigarettes, marijuana, and alcohol. And what we are seeing in terms of you are going to take the, take the grades of, of the United States in terms of adolescent drug taking, you can see that we're doing very, very well with respect to alcohol. Everything is relative. We still have very high rates of use of alcohol. But they are going at least the trajectories are going into the, the, in the right direction. And we're seeing less kids abusing alcohol. And we're also seeing less high school students binge drinking. Uh, we also incredibly good uh, progress that we've done in terms of cigarette smoking, where we've actually decreased cigarette smoking in the United States among teenagers by more than 50% over a period of 10 years. In contrast, we're seeing the increase in the consumption of marijuana. And for one, two, three, four years in a row, we have higher uh, rates of marijuana use than of cigarette smoking as this indicator of past month of use of these drugs. And this is something that we have never, ever seen in this uh, survey that was started in 1979. This is the first time that we're seeing that more kids are using, uh, in the past month, report using marijuana than, than tobacco. Of course, this reflects two phenomena, the one that is le leading by the increase, and the other one, the very significant progress that we're doing in cigarette smoking. So should we be concerned about it or not, about this pattern of increases in use of marijuana? Well, let's start, go, go backwards, and try to sort of get into why, why are people taking marijuana? They're taking marijuana because of these CB1 receptors that George was speaking about, which actually have high density, and they activate the, the, the reward pathways that is modulated very much by dopamine. And we now know that all of the drugs of abuse have a common pharmacological effect. All of them increase dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, but they do it by different uh, molecular targets. In the case of nicotine, they do it by the nicotine receptor. In the case of cocaine, by the dopamine transporter. And as you heard, in the case of marijuana, this is done by the CB1 receptor. Now this system is actually extraordinarily relevant for the survival of the individual and the species. Because the biology has uh, created this system that, that, that incentivizes our behaviors on the basis of reward or aversion or punishment. And this is extraordinarily powerful, simple system that is evolutionary concern. So if you want to link behaviors that are necessarily for survival, you want to ensure that the creatures will do them, you link them with the rewarding effects. If you want to ensure that the creatures avoid things that are harmful, you actually link them with the aversive system. And so that's why, no surprise, food and sex are linked with uh, this system. Why? Because if we don't eat or, or have sex, we don't procreate, we die as a species, and if we don't eat, of course, we die. Drugs just hijack this system, and they do it with different potencies. And this is, again, one of the issues that have generated a lot of controversy are all of the drug equivalents in terms of their ability to hijack the system, and the answer is no. There are some drugs that are more addictive than others based just on their pharmacological properties. So certainly, I'm choosing you here amphetamines. The amphetamines are very potent in activating the system. On the other hand, marijuana has much less potency in activating it. And this, again, could explain why, in general terms, uh, if you are exposed to amphetamine, um, your risk of becoming addicted is higher than if you are exposed to marijuana. However, you are, you ha your risk of getting addicted to marijuana is, um, is not trivial. And it's actually accentuated if you smoke marijuana as an adolescent. Now, uh, many of you uh, actually, and, and uh, George was discussing about it in terms of um, we have an extremely complex uh, endogenous cannabinoid system, which has actually just uh, the information is proliferating, and we're taking advantage of it. And, and marijuana is just targeting those, uh, those molecular systems that are affected by endogenous can cannabinoids, except that when you are taking marijuana, you're actually smoking um, these leaves that contain a wide variety of cannabinoids. And these cannabinoids have different properties. And these cannabinoids, actually, uh, the one that people pay a lot of money for if you want to get high is the 9 delta THC. That's the one that has these psychoactive uh, properties. But as we're discussing in terms of potential therapeutic benefits, for example, vis-a-vis -vis the ability of uh, some of these drugs to be potential treatments as anxiolytics or antipsychotics, then we're looking at this compound here, cannabidiol. Interestingly, and, and I'm not going to go into the details of this one, but it just illustrates the complexity of what we're doing, is that while we've identified the CB1 and the CB2 receptors as being the targets, there is increasing evidence that there are other receptors that are directly affected by these cannabinoids. And this is actually made very evident by the fact that these, this cannabinoid, cannabidiol, 
has very low affinity for either the CB1 and the CB2 receptor, indicating that it's probably pharmacologically acting to another target that we may know or we may not. Um, but for the, for the targets that we are very well studied that, that George was speaking about, the CB1 receptor particularly in the brain, they are very, very ubiquitous all over the place and at very high concentration. Some of the areas are higher than others, and, and Mike Herkenhan had this really incredible paper that opened our eyes about how widely distributed are how the high concentration of these, these particular receptors. And, and, and if you look at his old paper on autoradiography, you see a very, very high concentration in the cerebellum and also a very high concentration into the hippocampus. And that immediately gave an explanation about why is it that one of the main symptoms that you do when you take an acarabinoid agonist is in rats you get catatonic or you got that. But in humans, it's actually you impair motor coordination. And, in, and the thing that happens with memory, the first thing that happens with memory, why it's not very good to take a marijuana when you're studying, is that it impairs memory and learning. And while this may be an acute and may even have a chronic effect, an acute effect, if you are a student in terms of impairing your capacity to learn, is not negligible. But here I'm just going to make a comment that makes the whole issue of marijuana fascinating and much more complex than we would like it to make it for the lay public. What we are observing with cannabinoids, and I think that uh, Michael had observed that, and others had observed that, is the effects of the agonist are going to be dependent very much on the dose. So when you get, for example, marijuana, people smoke marijuana because they want to actually feel relaxed and, and calm and groovy. However, if they get a marijuana with very high content, or they actually take all of those um, candies and chocolates that you can buy in Colorado, you don't really know how much they can take huge doses. They can end up psychotic, increase anxiety. So we have this U-shaped curve that characterizes a lot of the things that we are observing with cannabinoids that are resulting in medical complications. So it's not very much pleasant when you get psychotic. And you will get psychotic if you have a high enough dose of 9-THC in your brain. Um, cannabinoids are vasodilated. They, they vasodilate, and that's absolutely wonderful. But if you get into the high doses, you produce vasoconstriction. And these, in the healthcare system, have generated a lot of interest because they're starting to see individuals coming with myocardial infarcts or with cerebral strokes associated with the use of very potent marijuana. The same thing, actually. One of the reasons why cannabinoids are one of the um, applications for which there is an FDA-approved pro product for cannabinoid agonists is nausea. So if you are in chemotherapy and you take a cannabinoid agonist, that is an anti-nausea. But if you get to take these very high doses of cannabinoids, there is an hyperemesis uh, syndrome that emerges that is so serious that you end up in the emergency room. But again, when we're discussing the black and whites and recognizing that the effects of cannabinoids have to be understood on the basis of the potency of the products that you're looking at. And in the brain, the same, the same type of phenomena, you're going to be the high, the high levels all over the place are going to explain why you have such a, a wide variety of effects of these drugs that can interfere with motor coordinations and learning, but they can also affect sensations and perception. They can also uh, uh, affect decision making. Now, is uh, marijuana addictive? And I told you, um, yes, it is addictive, but everybody says, well, how addictive it is. Well, this is one of the ways that we quantify addiction. It's an epidemiological way. It's not a pharmacological way. Epidemiology, of course, when you compare that, this is the number of people that become, the percentage that become addicted um, that are exposed to the drug. And you can see that in this epidemiological type of analysis, the more, most addictive of all of the drugs is tobacco. Now, what's interesting is if you do this in an animal model, you'll find out that tobacco, nicotine, is not the most addictive. Actually, it is quite hard to make animals administer nicotine. On the other hand, you have drugs like, um, as I was saying, the stimulants, that in an animal model are highly, highly addictive. And of course, the opiates are highly, highly addictive. So when you look at data like this one, there is a very important factor that's contributing to the epidemiological data, which is the distinction between having a drug that's legal and the distinction of having a drug that's illegal. Having a drug that, that's legal, number one, makes it more available, but it also changes the norms, such if you are a right-doing citizen that would not take an illegal drug, if it becomes legal, you may be able to take it. And, I, and that's one of the issues why we do respond to social norms. The fact of making marijuana legal 
will actually make an individual take it that otherwise would have not, just from the legality, the legality issue. But in general, with this epidemiological data, 9% of individuals that get exposed to marijuana actually will become addicted to it. And if you're an adolescent, that percentage goes to 16%. And if you are actually a regular daily uses, that, that percentage flow comes to a, close to 50% of individuals will become addicted if you're an adolescent smoking regularly. So it's not a trivial number. But we have to recognize that in terms of its properties with this epidemiological data, it does come out as one of the ones that's less addictive. Now, one of the things that had intrigued very much the field is that marijuana, the whole concept, and you all probably have heard about it, is there a, a, as a gateway drug. Because again, epidemiological studies show that uh, most kids that become and up taking drugs started taking marijuana. If you are honest about it and you look at the data carefully, you realize that most of those kids taking marijuana had started smoking tobacco or alcohol. So speaking about the gateway drug, you need to also consider the fact of the legal drugs being a gateway drug phenomenon. But what has the data shown us? The data has, and again, quite consistently shown us that if you actually, and this was a really elegant study because it was done in twins. So you were con controlling for genetic factors, very important because Vulnerability for addiction has a strong genetic component. And what they showed that the, the, the twins were discordant for the age of initiation. So uh, one twin had started before age 17 and the other ones after, seven, uh, after age 17. And they showed that uh, the odds for increasing use or abuse and dependence were much higher for those twins that had initiated before age 17. And this has then subsequently been replicated, indicating as for alcohol and nicotine, that the earlier you take these drugs, the greater the, the likelihood of becoming addicted to them, but also that these may prime your brain to the addictiveness of other drugs. And I don't know that that's specific for marijuana. As I say, there is some evidence that something similar is happening with nicotine. Now, one of the, the big question marks that we've had, and actually very important, because if you want to send messages, people always ask you, is it bad for you to take marijuana when you are a teenager? And the question is overall, the, uh, the evidence, why, why is it, can I tell you, black and white, yes, no. And, and, and I'm placed right now in a situation that we have sufficient evidence that shows that smoking marijuana during adolescence actually is harmful to the adolescent brain. But there are also studies that have basically identified that there's negative results, and there's also studies that criticize the design of these studies because they have not control for premorbid status, for the fact that if you were functioning, if your brain was not functioning properly, that may, may put you at greater risk for smoking marijuana, such that when they test you later on, you're not functioning very well, but it was not because of marijuana, but because your brain was not functioning to start well with. So that has been a constant criticism for a lot of the studies done on marijuana. However, one of the things that have come again from epidemiological studies come consistently and replicated by independent laboratory, which I, to me is very, very telling, is, and I'll show you, this is an old study, 2008, but I'm going to show you the new version, the newest version of this type of study that, again, has been replicated by a lot of people on 2014. This is the rate of use during your lifetime, during adolescence, and then you're an adult. Cannabis age 14 to 21, a lot of cannabis, never cannabis, for different indicators of performance when you are an adult. And what has been replicated consistently is that uh, if you smoke marijuana in a dose-related way, that will interfere with your capacity to finish school and to attain a degree. Again, very, very consistent findings. So when people ask me, is marijuana good or bad for your brain, I said, bottom line, it's not going to be good for the country. If we have a drug whose increased utilization in adolescence is going to result in a decrease in the ability of these uh, uh, kids to finish university. And it goes all of the, this is of course then could be underlie why they have a larger percent of unemployed and dependent on welfare if you don't finish your education. And I'm not going into the complexities of whether it, it, it harms your brain or not. If you don't finish school, that's not going to help you very much. This is the actually the, the newer version, 2014, of a completely different group. It's actually a pretty large cohort of uh, individuals, New Zealand, Australia. And they were actually exactly the same thing. Dose, daily versus less than once a month. High school completion, dose effect, much lower. Uh, degree attainment, dose effect, much lower. 
there's no effect on depression, and there's an increase in the welfare dependence. But what's also interesting is that in this uh, slide here, they actually document the same thing, what I was telling you, your adjusted odd rates, if you, the odds ratio if you smoke daily are much greater, no surprise there. Your increased use of other drugs, much greater, no surprise. What was a surprise, and actually I had never seen this in a study um, with such a large effect, was that they had seen an increase in suicide attempts. That was very significant. Just look at adjusted uh, ratio of uh, more than six for suicide if you're a regular user. I, 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 like anything else, and since we're all very sensitive about the issue of replicability, in my perspective, this finding is one that we need to pay attention, and basically, to try to determine if, in fact, it's reproducible or whether it's not. But, if it, but we cannot ignore it. We need to start to pay attention of whether, indeed, the consumption of marijuana may increase uh, suicidality. And, I, and again, as I say, this is not something for which there is uh, evidence from past investigation. This is another very important study in 2012, uh, published in PNAS. The, again, it's a study that, this study followed kids prospectively, 1,037 kids uh, from age 13. They measured their IQ, and then they followed their drug use during adolescence, and then when they are adults, 30 years of age, they test them for their IQ. So this study was very important because it was not the first one that controlled for pre-morbid IQ before you started to take marijuana but it was the one with the largest sample size. And what they showed is that if in those kids that smoke consistently during adolescence, marijuana, uh, controlling for their IQ, there was on average an eight-point IQ loss associated with the use of marijuana. That persisted even when they had stopped using marijuana in adulthood. On the other hand, when you took people that basically had not smoked much marijuana during adolescence and were smoking it in adulthood, that was not associated with a decrease in um, intelligence quotient, indicating that there's something, again, as one would expect, uh, related to the vulnerability of the adolescent brain. And again, these are studies that are, uh, the way that I view it, that are focusing us in terms of these are not trivial things that we can just ignore. This is another paper that was published very, very shortly after the paper on PNAS. But it uses brain imaging technology, specifically diffusion tensor imaging that allows you to look at the structural connectivity of the brain. The brain is a network, and the way that it works is by actually creating interactions with different areas of the brain. And with this technology, we can actually measure the density of these connections. And what this investigator showed in a study, and again, for imaging studies, this is a relatively well-sized well, uh, one. but. Um, when you are dealing in general disability, you come to realize that, that we need to actually, again, I, why I come back, there are, there are things that we can no longer ignore. These were individuals where they were comparing, using diffusion uh, tensor imaging, um, the connectivity of the brain of those that have been exposed to uh, marijuana during adolescence versus those that have not been exposed during adolescence. And they showed, interestingly, that the connectivity patterns that were deranged, that differ between both of them, were very localized in the brain, which to me was, first of all, a big surprise. But, but what's also very, very much interesting was the location of where these uh, defects were observed. One of them was one of the main connections into the hippocampus, which made a lot of sense because the hippocampus has a very high density of CB1 receptors. But the other one was actually uh, the precunius. And again, most people don't know what the precunius is. I didn't have the, the slightest idea about what the precunius was until something like 15 years ago when I started to encounter it. And now the precunius is everywhere. The precunius is one of the main nodes of the brain. So if you think of the brain as a network with multiple hubs, one of the, the hubs that has the highest levels of connectivity in the brain is the precunius. And I like to put the example of, an, of an, uh, an airport, networks of airports, right? So what are the hubs, the main hubs of networks of airports in the United States? And I think which, 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 which? Chicago, maybe, Dallas. Well, what happens if they are actually not connected? If you start to uh, block the flow of planes into them, you disrupt the rest of the United States. So think about it. That it's not very good to have your precunius not connected. How much are the decreases in connectivity on the smokers? Is it a small effect? 80 to 90% lower connectivity. So it's a very large effect in this specific pattern um, that are likely in this one hand to actually interfere. The hippocampus involved with memory. 
But the hippocampus is also involved in the ability to regulate stress responses. So it is very likely that disruption of this connectivity is going to impair not just the memory, but emotional reactivity. And the disruption of this very important node of the brain, hub of the brain, one of the main hubs, is likely to have widespread effects on the way that the brain processes information. And in fact, by the way, this is the hub that first becomes abnormal in patients suffering from Alzheimer's disease. In this particular study, they show that the age of initiation, the younger you are, the worse, the, 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 the more impaired this connectivity. So you bring these two and two together. And I said, could it be that by impairing the connectivity of the brain, the way that you form these connections, could it be that this is one of the mechanisms by which the repeated use of marijuana during adolescence could have lead to the impairment in cognitive function that persists even after you stop taking the drug? And again, these are questions that are already out there for to do the investigations to see if indeed this is the case or not. Another aspect about marijuana that has generated a lot of interest, certainly in the psychiatric community and in the medical community in general, was, and you go into the, the medical the textbooks, and they say that use, chronic use of marijuana generates an amotivational syndrome. What's interesting, and this I was, I mean, you know, sort of says in medical school, and they said a motivational syndrome. So, but if you go into the literature, into the scientific literature, and this is a problem that we have with marijuana, you actually look, what are the scientific papers that really document that chronic marijuana produces a motivation? And the reality is, if I am very critical, I say very, very few. So I was surprised that there was this whole consensus that yes, marijuana produces a motivation. But the scientific literature backing it up is actually extremely meager. Now, why would I be interested on motivation? Well, pay attention on your capacity to memorize, your capacity to pay attention. But can you imagine what it means to not be motivated? And now think about it, because if you think about what leads you to uh, do well at school, it's not just your intelligence and your capacity to memorize and blah, blah, blah. It's the motivation that you have to perform and to do well at school. And so disruption in motivation, in disruption of motivation, could have really devastating effects on the educational or professional career of someone. So the question is, does marijuana really produce this motivational syndrome, or this is something that we generated by culture and belief? Well, since the literature is very little, I cannot provide you with very strong evidence one way or the other, but I'm going to start you to show you the data that is starting to emerge to indicate that indeed there is a possibility that the repeated use of marijuana may be disrupting the circuits in the brain that are involved with motivation. So what are all of those circuits? I told you our brain is motivated by reward and avoiding aversion. And that is driven in part by dopaminergic system. So this paper published in 2014 that has been subsequently replicated by the group Bloomfield et al. Uh, using positron emission tomography with fluorinating dopa that is a marker of dopamine synthesis, actually and comparing individuals that smoke marijuana regularly versus those that do not, showed a significant decrease throughout the whole striatum in the dopamine content of individuals that are smokers. And they go uh, further to actually show not only was there a decrease in the synthesis capacity of uh, the, in the brain of these individuals, specifically in the striatum, but there was also a, that, that decrease was associated in a rating for a motivation. So indeed, they were able to document not just uh, the fact that these individuals had higher scores on this scale of a motivation, but that this was associated with a reduction in the synthesis capacity of dopamine, or, of dopamine in the brain. We subsequently, I mean, being very frustrated and says there's so very, very little data, let's, let's do something about it. And since I'm a brainy imager and my colleagues at Brookhaven National Laboratory, let's say, let's look at it. If there is a motivation, can we actually, using a different procedure from the fluorinating DOPA, document that there is decreased signaling in the brain of marijuana abusers? So, so we did these studies, and uh, I mean, it's a complex study design, so I'm not going to actually go into it because it actually it was not as simple as what we showed. But what was very clear and evident is, number one, that the marijuana, these are the healthy controls, and these are the marijuana abusers, average 24, 24. And what I'm showing you here is the response of the brain to methylphenidate. It's a stimulant drug 
that activates the dopaminergic and the noradrenergic system. And we're measuring it with a ligand that binds to dopamine D2 and D3 receptors. And what you see is a dramatic reduction in the binding all over the brain when you challenge in normal people. If you are a marijuana abuser and you challenge, you have a very, very attenuated effect. And this was, in parallel, associated with a very attenuated behavioral effect to the drug and a very attenuated cardiovascular response to the drug. So marijuana abusers is like their brain is buffering the effects of this hyperstimulation, which of course may be one of the reasons why people like to smoke marijuana, because it basically makes you groove, it makes you less reactive. Now, this may be OK if you are stressed, but if it's not OK, if this decrease in reactivity is associated with a decrease in response to natural stimuli that should motivate you. And what we showed indeed was that in when, we, when we use a different scale from, from the European group, a one that monitors the negative emotionality, and what we showed, which is a personality measure of irritability dysphoria, we showed to start with that marijuana abusers have much higher levels of negative emotionality. So Overall, you may be smoking marijuana and feeling groovy, but uh, when you are not smoking marijuana, your scores on negative emotionality are much higher, and that is directly associated with uh, the decreased reactivity in the dopamine system, such that the higher your scores, the lower the reactivity. Again, providing evidence that chronic marijuana is disrupting the ability of the brain dopaminergic system, or the brain in general, I don't think it's just the dopamine system itself, to respond when you stimulate those dopaminergic pathways. So you stimulate the dopaminergic pathways, and the reactivity is basically very blunted, which could, of course, underline a motivational syndrome. Mental illness, and again, extremely important. The Europeans have been obsessed about it, the Americans much less so. So the Europeans have been doing a lot of studies trying to determine is the use of marijuana, because if you, again, if you take a high dose of uh, THT, um, you can become psychotic. Any one of us can become psychotic with a high, high dose of 9-THT. But the question was, is that just limited, or can you develop into schizophrenia? And again, many studies have come around, and, and one of the things has been, well, in order to do that, can we even document that marijuana, chronic marijuana, um, we're showing shows uh, the dopamine system, but what, but what about the cannabinoid system? Because as George was mentioning for a lot of the peripheral organs, the endogenous cannabinoid system is also very important for modulating an our anxiety responses. And if you block it, you're actually much more prone to having an adverse anxiety reaction. And that's one of the reasons why there is interest on in the use of marijuana for a post-traumatic stress disorder. Except let me tell you something, something that everybody ignores. And again, it's so very obvious to my brain, but people like to ignore it. It's like selective blindness. When you take marijuana, you will have, unless you take very high doses, you will feel decreased anxiety. And probably if you are very anxious, that may feel good. But like uh, George was saying, when you take these drugs, whether it's an opioid or you take a marijuana, where you are targeting the same receptor that is targeted by the, your own endogenous system, you decrease the synthesis of that particular endogenous uh, ligand. So when you take opioids, uh, heroin, you actually release the production of your own endogenous opioids. And when you take actually marijuana, you and reduce the production of your own endogenous cannabinoids. And this is a study that actually done by the group at Bob Innes. Uh, in which he actually is measuring again, the same PET ligand that uh, George was me um, um, speaking about that measures the CB1 receptor, showing that, yes, in the marijuana abusers carrying black, actually you all have a decrease in the concentration of cannabinoid CB1 receptors in the brain. So the question is, if we think about marijuana being good for PTSD, the question is what happens when you are no longer intoxicated? when your CB1 receptors to start with are going to be decreased, and your own endogenous production is going to be also be decreased. And again, and it is the, the issue of understanding the dynamics, not just in terms of, do, of those, but the effects that are acute, and what uh, it may trigger in terms of neuroadaptations that may exacerbate the disease process itself. So coming to the psychotic effect, because I think that is, again, as I was saying, the Europeans have been obsessed by it. 
the first study was the, that enlarged, actually, that alerted the attention of the field because there were small studies and clinical reports of patients coming in with schizophrenia when that trigger was triggered by smoking marijuana. But there, then when the studies became of large cohorts, uh, the first one in uh, 1987, the study of the Swedish conscripts, that actually established the number of cases of uh, basically cannabis-associated psychosis, and as, as a function of the times taken, that alerted the field. It alerted it because they, first of all, they saw a dose effect, and it was a sample that could not just be ignored in terms of its ability to detect an effect site. Then there was a, a, a uh, subsequent in 2002, a study also done in a smaller group of individuals, but nonetheless 1,037, that estimated the odds ratios for developing uh, schizophrenia at age 26, uh, indicating that those who were consuming uh, cannabinoids were much more likely to the daily to consume, to get schizophrenia than those that uh, had not used it by age 18. Those are the old studies, the new studies. What do they show? New study number one that was published in 2012 is a fascinating one because it actually identifies the whole concept of diseases that we're saying. You can, get, you can smoke all your life and be 100 years old and you never get uh, lung cancer. Uh, so, so, and, and, and it's not because uh, cigarette smoking is not increasing the risk of lung cancer. It's because there is an interaction between your genetic vulnerability and the drug you're consuming. And so what was fascinating about this study is that they were looking at a gene, the AKT1, which had been associated with the risk of schizophrenia. So this is one of the, the genes that uh, has been, by independent investigators, associated with conferring a risk for schizophrenia. And the high-risk allele, which is the CC1, CC1 uh, is the one that you see here. You can, but what was interesting is that smoking marijuana, so they compare on the function, as a function of your allele, whether you have the risk allele, the, uh, the, the one that you have both risk in both sides, the heterozygous, and the ones without the risk allele. If you smoke and you don't have the risk allele, nothing happens to you. If you smoke marijuana and you just have one of them, you are an heterozygous, nothing happens to you. But if you do have both of them, your risk of developing schizophrenia is sevenfold higher, identifying one of the largest factors associated with developing schizophrenia, consumption of regular marijuana when you have the risk allele basically just increases the likelihood that you'll end up with a schizophrenia. And recently, two weeks ago, this paper made it up into the Lancet and generated a lot, a lot of attention because they actually look at uh, South London. Now, I don't know anything about South London, but I think that South London must have a very active uh, drug, drug uh, population because you can get very, very high content marijuana. And they were interested and very easily available at high prevalence rates. So they um, surveyed these individuals that, uh, in, from a hospital that they end up in the emergency room with diagnosis of schizophrenia. And they were actually then looking at the extent to which they have been exposed to marijuana. And what was interesting by them, again, is that those individuals that have been exposed to skunk, skunk is a kind of marijuana with very high content THC. I think I don't know exactly what it is. It's like 12, 16 percent. And actually, that's, some of that is, uh, it circulates in, in our country. Those that use it regular have a five-fold increase for risk of developing uh, chronic psychosis, indicating that this risk is not trivial. I, in this particular study, though, what, what was unclear to me is that I do not know that these numbers, how long they follow them to chronicity, because it is, and, 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 I, and again, I know because I've actually worked with cannabinoids, 9-THC, and we were giving high doses, and you actually can trigger a psychotic episode. So, but, but they are short-lasting. What this study does not really tell us is this guy Paul, what percentage of those are going to go into a chronic state, which, of course, is the, the one that will be a much greater risk for, uh, and the one that we should be most concerned about. So yes, uh, use of marijuana is not as benign as we would like to do. We like to compare it to nicotine. We like to compare it to alcohol. But they have very different effects, and we need to actually look at them. And I end my presentation for the THC of today, because that's the other thing that, I, that we are faced. We have a very large, the baby boomers that consume a lot of marijuana when they were young, and they said, 
oh my God, I look at, because I, I smoke marijuana all of my life and look how well I'm doing. And so they, they basically, that then leads them to be much more per se, per, uh, permissive with respect to the use of marijuana in their children. But look at the potency of THC. This was 1995, so I'm not looking at the ones when they were growing up in the 72 where it was 2%. But from 1995, it's 4%. We currently have it at 13%. 13% 9-THC. And look at the very dramatic increase from 2009 to 2012. We see a steep increase in the content of 9-THC. This, this marijuana with high content THC is going to be more addictive, and this marijuana is going to be associated with much more likelihood of side effect, harmful effect. And indeed, if you look, for example, at this data here that actually uh, plots the drug-related emergency department visits in the United States, you have Marijuana, look at the very significant increases that are basically a 50% increase since 2004 over a seven year period. In a period where we are not seeing increases in emergency room, either from cocaine or heroin, even heroin, which actually is increasing in the United States. So this indicates that this very sharp increase is not, uh, cannot be explained just on the basis of these very sort of increases in the adult population because they are not so large these very significant increases in emergency rooms, and as well as in treatment programs are likely to reflect the fact that we have access to a much more potent marijuana. And indeed, the blood samples from, uh, that are taken, this is from a group in Europe where they actually get the blood content of THC in um, drivers. And you can see over the years, they are going up and up and up. And I'm bringing this up because a lot of people, when you hear, and they make the dismissal, oh, no, 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 neither is exaggerating, blah, blah, blah. They say that there are THC content, but it doesn't matter because you, you treat the eight. You treat the eight, and so you stay yourself at the same level. Well, guys, that's not exactly what the data is showing. If you actually monitor and quantify, you're seeing that the content of 9-THC in blood is going up. And this is likely to account for the higher problems that we're seeing with the drug. And this is my, my last slide, and I think it's a slide that is important because it shows us, again, monitoring the future, but now I'm showing you uh, of the past year marijuana use versus perceived risk of occasional marijuana use. Perceived risk, the number of kids that think that smoking marijuana is dangerous. And then, of course, the past year use. And what you can see is that it mirror one another. The greater the number of kids that think that marijuana is harmful, the less the number of kids that are smoking, indicating that actually messages, prevention, accurate information to adolescents is extraordinarily important in motivating their, our, their behavior. Adolescents are sensitive to the notion of adverse effects of uh, drugs, even though there is a subgroup that likes the risk as part of the excitement. There is also a group of adolescents that is sensitive to norms. And so one of the things that we need to provide adolescents, as well as one, a policymaker, is a very good information about what is it that um, marijuana is doing into the brain. So one of the priorities of our institute uh, uh, at NIDA, and in also in partnership with the Alcohol Institute and many other institutes, is to actually do a longitudinal study that is power sufficiently, that use the most sophisticated technologies to evaluate in a large cohort what are the effects of those exposures in the individual brain trajectories? So that we can answer that question. Is exposure to marijuana affecting my, the brain, my, where, my, my, the way my brain is being connected, the way my brain is, is functioning? Is it influencing my risk for mental illnesses? Is it interfering with my cognitive capacity? And I think that we owe it and now that all of these policy changes are happening, whether we like them or not, and that in turn is, uh, making the use of marijuana much more accessible and available, not just for adults, but actually for adolescents too. And with that, I want to thank uh, you, uh, uh, Erwin, for giving me an opportunity to speak to you all about this, the ups and downs of marijuana and the in-betweens. Thank you, thank you. Well, we have another full hour to entertain all your questions, so please. Um, you showed in the Monitoring the Future study that high school alcohol and cigarette use has consistently decreased over the last 15 years while the use of marijuana has remained relatively stable. You said it was increasing. I think it's stable. 
Anyway, do you think this is evidence that legalization with strict regulation and sound education can effectively reduce adolescent drug use? It would, be, it would be fantastic, and in fact, this is the argument that a lot of these uh, policymakers on the states are saying, we're not promoting the legalization of marijuana to teenagers, we're going to control it. But if you actually look at the number of kids that ex are exposed to alcohol where it is controlled, I would say 80% of kids, if not much more, in the United States when they finish high school have been exposed several times to alcohol. So we don't do a very good job at uh, controlling and regulating the access of alcohol to teenagers. So while theoretically it sounds very nice, it's actually there's no evidence that we have been able to do interventions that protects adolescents from exposure to these legal drugs. That is the problem. And, and in fact, it would be, I, I think that the dialogue would be very, very different if in fact you could create a system that actually was shown to work and protect kids. And, and in Colorado, where these things are happening, for example, they are seeing a 30% increase in number of school dropouts and, and, and basically letting them out because of use of marijuana within that short period of time. So we are not doing a very good job at controlling these substances from adolescents. Hi, fantastic lecture. Um, I have a question about, um, for example, in Amsterdam, where they've legalized you know, marijuana for many years. H how do you think from a societal level has that, has, for example, has their IQ levels psychosis rates, etc. How do you think that's been changed, you know, as a society as a whole, having legalized marijuana over many years? Yeah, no, and it was, you know, it was one of the things that I didn't learn until I was uh, director of NIDE and I was visiting Amsterdam, that actually the rate of use of marijuana among uh, teenagers in, in Amsterdam is very low. Most of the marijuana use goes for tourism. The problem that they are having actually right now, where there's an, an, uh, really an attempt to try to regulate it, the country has had a lot of trouble because the producers of marijuana are exporting, so they cannot control it. So, I mean, and, and I bring this up because one of the arguments that people make is that you will be able to make tax revenue that you can invest without recognizing that there are costs associated with that legalization that in this case is associated with a difficulty of controlling the exportation of marijuana. So. With respect to that, and I was actually quite, uh, curious because why, why is it that we have such a different pattern of drug use in a country like Amsterdam or in a city like Amsterdam and in the United States or Canada, which are two countries with very high rates of, of drug use. So uh, understanding what is it that they are doing differently would be very important because then can we implement something like that to try to intervene so that kids don't get exposed to drugs, that they don't use them as frequently as other, other countries. Yes. Um, my name is Paula Gordon. I have a um, um, website on um, called gordondrugabusepreventioncom um, I know we talked about this earlier, but I want to mention the exchange that you had with the Dalai Lama uh, in uh, 2013, in the fall was extraordinary, uh, and you're showing him in this two-hour, 20-minute presentation of uh, um, uh, brain scans of those who were addicted. I wonder if you could uh, tell us uh, what your, um, what your uh, possible um, action might be with respect to making sure that that message that you conveyed to the Dalai Lama and the exchange that you had could reach as many as possible, not only for the, the, the um, help of the people who are addicts, but for the help of those who are trying to treat and help them, because I think it's a very hopeful message. So the Dalai Lama. Yeah, no, and I think that I was fascinated by the concept of the Dalai Lama. So when they asked me to go and says, no, don't say no, just go, go, go. And I was very happy, it was great to meet the Dalai Lama. But, but the issue that intrigued me very much was the concept that here you have a man that through meditation and a lifestyle has optimized his ability to control his body in ways that are extraordinary, that very few people can. And this is exactly the opposite to what happens when someone is addicted, where they lose the control over their own behaviors. So I was very intrigued about how could we learn from those practices that they use um, in the Buddhism, he doesn't like to call it a religion, he calls it a science, on, on, the, on, on the whole discipline of Buddhism, 
that could, we could help implement to, to help people that are addicted to drugs because it's a very devastating disease and, and we need better therapeutic interventions. And so that's, that's what I went there. But, and it was a very, very fantastic exchange. And I just thought that because it's in the web and YouTube and anybody can, can look at it. <laughs> But I, I heard you that sort of says maybe it's too long and we, make, we may need to make it short. So I'll ask my, my staff and see if there's a way of, of making it shorter so that people don't have to spend so much time watching. Hi. Um, I guess I just had a question on cause and effect. Um, so you had those statistics on um, adolescents using marijuana and then um, a decreased likelihood of graduating from college or increase of suicide. Um, but I was just wondering if um, there are any studies, like statistical studies, on um, whether uh, people that maybe, like a type of people like that had a propensity maybe not to go to college, like started using marijuana, and then that's why these statistics uh, increased or decreased. Absolutely. No, I think that that's, that's one of the problems why I sort of say there's hole on, holes on the science. Because even that Dunedin study that shows it in terms of decreases in IQ, one of the complaints that had been done, the criticism on that study, was that the groups may have come from different economical backgrounds. And the family influence uh, may, in turn, have determined whether you really strive and improve your, your IQ or not. So this is why, I, I, in, in my brain, I say this, all of these studies are actually highlighting that there may be a signal there. But they are not black and white. And, and that we need to do a study that can help us address those questions in an objective way, not exaggerating, because it sort of actually is the first thing that people say, well, why don't you come up and say this is terrible, blah, blah, blah. This is, we need to put the context, understand what the signal is and where are the errors. And that's why we're really pushing towards doing this study on 10,000, very well controlled, so that we can un unequivocally try to answer these questions. And then based on those findings, then you can do studies to look at causality, but where, where the rigor will basically cannot be questioned. I wonder, Nora, you meet with a lot of uh, youngsters. What, what are the kinds of questions that they ask you about drugs these days? Well, there was, uh, we, we have every, every year, actually, we come scientists from all over the place and actually um, from, and from different institutes, and David was one of them, and we all sit there and we are trying to answer questions from adolescents from high schools all over the place. And it's actually interesting because over the years it has changed some. So these, uh, these past two years, three years, there's been a lot of questions on marijuana clearly driven by this phenomena. But we also see a lot of questions, for example, which we have not seen in the past about electronic cigarettes, which is a new device that's permeating actually in, in the young people, the adolescents, and for which we know very much. But they want to know if uh, these drugs are harmful. They want to know what to do if they have a relative that is taking drugs. They want to know how to intervene if one of their friends is taking drugs, what they should do. Does anyone know why plants uh, secrete a substance like a cannabinoid? What, does it have any value to the species? Well, I think you, you actually, uh, your uh, son-in-law gave me this fantastic book on plants that actually goes into some of those phenomena. And we do know for nicotine, for cocaine, they have, uh, they protect against insects. For cannabinoids, I don't know exactly, but we have the cannabinoid expert here. Does it make the insects a little bit woozy so they <laughs> go somewhere else? Well, for, for, co for cocaine, it can be extremely toxic. For nicotine, it's also very toxic. But I, I, it's an interesting for cannabinoids. I do not know. It would be interesting to know. Well, with that would mean that then some insects must have these receptors. I mean, uh, obviously. Um, you spoke earlier about myocardial infarctions and strokes having some associations with cannabis use. And you also showed the figure about increased emergency department visits associated with increased cannabis use. And uh, I'm sure you know that the THC metabol metabolites stay in the blood for a long time because they are lipophilic. Yeah. So how are those um, marijuana-related events defined? And do you think that it's really the cannabis that is leading to these events, or is it just an underlying signal because those people may have used in the past couple of weeks? 
You know, and, and that is one of the things that makes the stories of associations very difficult with marijuana. Now, what in the, and this is one of the questions that say, how proximal was the event of the consumption of marijuana? So you are, you are positive. And there was just a, a recent meta-analysis, I think it's on JAMA or Lancet or one of them, that looks specifically at the cardiovascular ones and the, and the proximity of the events. And they conclude on the basis of this meta-analysis that the evidence is quite strong to suggest that this was associated cardiovascular. In the, in the strokes, there, they, has, they have not been a, a rig, as rigorous meta-analysis done for the stroke. So the studies are more in clinical reports of a much higher risk of uh, having individuals that are young with stroke that have smoked marijuana. But you, where you could actually say, well, you know, and I, and I suspect what's going to be happening too is that association if you have a risk um, for vascular pathology and then you take a cannabinoid that may put you over that, so, so that you observe it just in those that are higher risk. But there is for that, I mean, right. certainly well, for the vascular. Uh, and there's very high density of CB1 receptors in, in, in blood vessels, actually. Do you have a quick question? Well, I, I mean, the, yeah, no, and the question is very important because it's obviously, it relates to the fact that if we're speaking about medical marijuana and therapeutics, we need to provide the evidence that it works. So where does it, there evidence of marijuana having um, therapeutic potential? Where is the evidence? That doesn't mean that uh, it ha doesn't have other therapeutic potencies, it just hasn't been shown. Analgesia as an anti-nausea to improve appetite in patients, for example, with HIV. And, and there is some evidence, I mean, there's also glaucoma, and then there's some evidence that it may have some anti-inflammatory effects, but that evidence is not, it's at that lower level. But if you are proposing the use of marijuana per se, I mean, my, my, my argument is that we have technology and science in order to identify what are the active ingredients on a plant that are likely to have the most optimal effects and minimal risk effects. I also need to actually know, so if you are going to use the plant, you don't really know which are the constituents and what are the concentrations. So that is a problem that, it, that needs to be addressed. So if someone, for example, there's a lot of interest right now on the potential use of cannabinoids for kids that have these seizures that cannot be controlled with regular anti-epileptics. And there are currently three large clinical trials ongoing. And NIDA is participating by providing the marijuana, but this is marijuana that has extremely high content of cannabidiol. And in fact, they are extracting the cannabidiol in order to give it in an oral form to these children. And, but that's the way, I mean, you need to do it with very specific control and regulation of the delivery and the content that you are giving. And that's, I would, I would hope that that research will start to answer those questions. And uh, there is currently work ongoing to investigate, as I mentioned, post-traumatic stress disorder. There is some work in terms of Alzheimer's. It's interesting because there has been this whole sense that it may have anti-inflammatory effects. So it was interesting mm -hmm. to actually hear uh, the presentation of, of George because he actually is showing that, in fact, it's activating microglia and producing pro-inflammation in these organs. I wouldn't have expected it. I would have expected exactly the opposite. But that's why we do science, because we can have beliefs and prejudices. And so we need to actually find out. And, and, and if it works, great. And if it doesn't work, then you don't want to be prescribing it to someone instead of prescribing them something that could help them. Dr. Chen, so you mentioned that hydrocannabinol goes into different parts of the brain. You also mentioned there is a axon fiber distraction. We know that the when the neurons die, the axon fibers are distracted. So is it the effect of the toxicity on the cells in the hippocampus and on other areas of the brain in conjunction with that and distraction of the axonal fiber? 
from what we know, we know, don't know specifically, but what we know from the cannabinoid system in development is it's very important in forming uh, axonal arborizations. So if you interrupt that pathway, the connections between neurons do not form properly. So my, inter I mean, again, it's just purely, purely speculative because the data is from taking it from rats to bringing it into humans. So the way that I was interpreting is, if you do have the cannabinoid system in involved in the formation of connections, and you are actually hypersaturating them, that may have interfered with that normal, very well orchestrated and timely, very timely, precise uh, pathways by which neurons form each other. So I wasn't, I, I don't think there's any evidence that I know of that cannabinoid agonists produce apoptosis of uh, neurons in the brain at the doses that are going to be achieved with drug taking. I don't think there's any evidence, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know of anything. And if there were, because they, they, you have the polarized, marijuana is wonderful of everything, and then the other ones that says marijuana is, you just see it and your brain dissolves. Those people who have been playing this song about marijuana killing yourself, that's the sort of, I, I don't think there's any so evidence. When you're at the study, you're taking on a study of the drug abuse in the Yes, that's exactly. It's, it's inspired by the far, farming gale, that yes. story. Right. As soon as we can start it, April 14. So in inflammatory bowel disease, which has many of the mediated factors of the kind you've described in this different rat model of diabetes, uh, cannabinoids appear in the literature as being beneficial. They reduce all sorts of sort of things. Do you think that your studies provide a clue as to a possible mechanism where something like that may actually be occurring? Are you investigating uh, other inflammatory immune diseases? Uh, CB2 receptors do have anti-inflammatory activity, and THC has both CB1 and CB2 activity. So the net effect depends on, obviously, circumstances, but that may explain some of the controversies that if you purely stimulate CB1, that's pro-inflammatory in vascular tissue, macrophages, uh, microglia, but THC is a mixed CB1, CB2 agonist, so that may be one of the explanations. Uh, There's some evidence that CB2 was published evidence. We actually were asked to write a commentary for Nature Medicine on a paper on that has beneficial effect in animal model of inflammatory bowel disease through its anti-inflammatory action. All right. But I have one question to Nora is that you very nicely pointed out in the early part of the discussion that THC is relatively, has low level of addiction potential relative to uh, nicotine or other substances. Are there statistics emerges for spice or designer drugs that sometimes have synthetic THC analogs which are 100 times more potent than THC? In the cardiovascular field, it certainly looks that they are much more dangerous in causing infarction and, and cardiovascular events than THC itself. So that could be a danger emerging that these designer drugs start to spread. It's the same way as hero heroin is much more harmful than morphine used to be, <coughs> which itself is more harmful than codeine. Is there any statistics on spice? And yeah, no, and we started to look at it actually for the first time in 20... I think it was 2012 on monitoring the future, asking the rate of use of these synthetic cannabinoids called spice. It was very high. It was something like 11 percent. But so it was, it was a trend that occurred very rapidly. It was the first time that we were evaluating it, but we were surprised high levels in the past year use of among uh, 12 graders of 11 percent. But then in the media, if you follow the media, there's been a series of many reports of very, very adverse reactions to spice that include not just the fact that you have a myocardial impact, but you basically go into a coma that you can die from these substances. And I think that it's interesting because when you have a drug that emerges and now with the media attention showing that it can be very harmful, that actually makes people not want to take it. And, and what we've seen very rapidly following or since then, which is 2012 and the past two years, or, or it was 2011, We've seen a very significant dec decline in the use of synthetic cannabinoids among teenagers. So I suspect, George, that what happens is that the effects are so potent that it becomes aversive. And one of the things that I'm curious to know is that 
because the 90 HD content of the current marijuana is going high and high, that, my, that, my, that may start to become aversive to people the first time they take it. And, you know, I've come, uh, people, again, this is anecdotal that they say, well, you know, Nora, I used to smoke when I was a teenager, and I tried it, and I didn't like it. It was just that the effects were very aversive, very anxiety-provoking. So it's a very different uh, effect. So the concept that at one point, um, while for someone that is used to uh, marijuana, it may be okay, if you are a first-time user consuming this drug and make you feel very aversive and anxious, may protect you against taking it again. So um, for, for uh, synthetic cannabinoids, we're not seeing a problem right now. It's basically appears to be controlled, but it, they are very potent, and um, and obviously uh, it's an issue of concern. Okay, well, listen, I want to thank both of you for a really very exciting afternoon. <laughs>